Good morning, everybody. Great to see you all here, bright and early. Thanks for coming along. Um, today I want to talk to you about curiosity. Um, I want to tell you a story about making learners deeply curious through the pedagogy of deception, aka lying. It was scary, it was risky. We put them in really uncomfortable places in order to get things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. And here's why. This. Curiosity, or rather, the loss of. Because curiosity is so incredibly important, isn't it? Alongside intelligence and conscientiousness, it's curiosity that gives us this hunger for active exploration, that drives us to look really deeply into things, to go beneath the surface, to ask really good questions and to lead us to great things. Now, kids are born curious, aren't they? You know, they play, they explore, they imagine they invent, they don't fear failure in the way that adults do and they've got this beautiful sense of wonder. And then this happens, they go to school, college, university, buildings like this and knowledge is chunked into discrete units, it's measured, it's categorised, it's ranked, quality assurance processes give us these external value systems that are then internalised by our learners. And they soon, learn to, you know, they soon learn to do what they need to do in order to pass an exam, to differentiate between work and play. And ironically, in this process, that beautiful childlike sense of curiosity is often lost somewhere along the way. And you know, the problem with all these quality assurance type processes and these cultures of mitigation of risk is that it's really counterintuitive when it comes to curiosity, play, creativity, because they demand that we take risks that we don't fear failure. And so how can we make our learners really curious? How can we bring that innate sense of curiosity back into learning when students are at a stage where often they're kind of now more than ever becoming consumers, you know, especially in the UK as um, tuition fees increase. Students are consumers, they're investors in their learning and they're very much focused in, on what needs to be done to get a first, to get a job. And so we're moving towards this education for employment rather than enlightenment. And that saddens me. It's been frustrating me for a while and it's only getting worse as the fees are increasing. So what I did was, uh, I worked with a friend of mine, a digital media producer called Hugh Gary, and we used elements of alternate reality gaming um, as a structure for engagement. So essentially what we did, we ran an entire module as an alternate reality game, unbeknown to the learners. So the module is called Advanced Multimedia. Um, in this module, the students develop their professionalised online identities um, alongside critical media literacies through studying remix culture, transmedia storytelling, um, mobile phone filmmaking, which is particularly important in this case. It's a real kind of digital media free-for-all. We've been doing this for about six years now. And they do great work, but they're just not curious. You know, they want to be spoon-fed. They want to be told what to do. And I'm sick of this, okay? So, um, you know, the, the module itself has a lot in common with, you know, open educational practices. It's about publishing, sharing, connecting. And I'm based in a science faculty, so this is quite unusual for our learners. They often have a very narrow view of learning. They want to know what needs to be done when. They want to get a, you know, get a degree and get a job. And that's about it. They don't really ask questions. What I want them to do is to go beyond what's there. Go beyond the curriculum. Go beyond the assessment. Dig deep and question everything. So in order to do this, we invented a character, Rufy Franzen, a name that didn't exist on the internet. It wasn't Googleable. And in July last year, started populating a multitude of online social spaces with all manner of wonderful web goodness that would lead to great learning. So there's so many amazing videos out there, you know, TED Talks and the like. And I wanted them to watch all of these things, but they wouldn't be assessed on them. And normally, if you ask students to go and watch 30 videos that they're not going to be assessed on, they're often not going to do it. So this is a way to kind of trick them into it, I guess. There were clues all over these spaces, articles we wanted them to read, um, lots of visual and numerical clues, codes, things for them to crack. So we set up this sort of wonderful world of web weirdness and web goodness for them to explore. And Rufy Franzen was going to be our device. He was the person that was going to make them curious and make them to really dig deep into all this content. Now, we wanted to end the ARG with some, a major event, something to really blow their minds. So 
we went to the UK's national broadcaster, the BBC, and managed to get them to agree to let us use this huge screen of theirs in the centre of Manchester to broadcast the students' mobile phone films. Um, they're not my students there, they're actually England football fans. You know, I'm bemoaning a mass HE system, but thankfully I don't actually have that many students yet. But it does give you an idea of the scale of this square, which is also known as the triangle. So now the game could start. This was the beginning of October and we had to get the students to this square by the 9th of December 2011. That was the date of the broadcast, 11am, their films were going to start playing. So we had two and a half months to get them there and get them to consume all of this content in the process without realising that we were actually really deeply learning. So we sent um, a letter to the home addresses of some of the students with a series of numbers which related to the date of the broadcast. Obviously they didn't know this. So this was really exciting. The game was starting. Unfortunately, we didn't anticipate their reaction. They became angry, <laughs> paranoid, scared. Um, one of the students actually complained to the university about a security breach in terms of their personal data. Um, <laughs> Around this time, Rufy, i.e. us, starts communicating with the students, you know, on the social platforms, and one of the students took to Twitter to threaten Rufy with violence. <laughs> this was going horribly wrong, and all of a sudden it dawned on me. I only tell one colleague what I was doing, because obviously I'd get into trouble. Um, and he was really worried and said, look, you could lose your job over this. Um, it was actually really worrying, because I was in a position of trust. Not only was I taking their course, I was also the programme leader for their degree and their personal tutor, the person they're meant to come to, you know, when they're scared, when they're angry, when they're paranoid, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it all got a bit hairy. Nearly stopped the game, because um, I thought I should try and keep my job, you know. Um, but in a last-ditch attempt to <laughs> try and drive the, go the game forward, sent the students an email explaining that I'd made contact with the mysterious Rufy friends and I couldn't tell them anything more. They had to trust me on this. I thought it was leading somewhere amazing, I just didn't know where, okay? So, thankfully, by abusing my position of trust, the students began to feel safe and they became intrigued. Now they wanted to know, who is Rufy Franzen and why has he chosen us? What does he want? And then something amazing happened. They started to drive their own learning, okay? They started to go so deeply into the curriculum without being told what to do. They're doing everything they're meant to do and more. And I'm just there in the background kind of pretending I don't know what's going on, lying and getting quite stressed if I'm honest with you. But it was fun. Um, and all these wonderful learning behaviours emerged. You know, as I said, we're going so deeply into the content. And they started making kind of cryptic videos and uploading them to YouTube to try and freak Rufy out the way that he had with them. Um, they were cracking codes, solving puzzles, setting up Google Docs so they could try and record every interaction with Rufy, every clue, to try and piece this mystery together. And in the process, they are consuming so much content and learning so much. You can see some examples here of cryptic codes, videos. There. There's a Steve Jobs video that was a great mashup that Huey did where if you watched it at normal size, you couldn't see anything. If you watched it full screen, you started to see subliminal messages. Now, all it took was one video with subliminal messages to make them watch all the videos to see if they could find subliminal messages. <laughs> but there weren't any. But that wasn't the point. They watched the videos. Uh, <laughs> so this went on for two and a half months. I'm trying to tell this to you in like five minutes. So, you, you know, but it was completely crazy. There were highs, there were lows. Learning through paranoia was the thing that triggered it off. And what was really interesting was that as we got more deeply into the game, myself and Hugh started getting paranoid because they're doing things and saying things and we don't know whether they know what's going on. And, oh my God, this was a real ARG. No one knew what was real and what wasn't anymore. This was exciting. So the night before the reveal on the 9th of December 2011, Rufy told the students that he'd give them an opportunity to ask him five yes, no questions in a live web broadcast at 10 p.m. Okay, only one of the students could ask the questions. The rest of the students were invited along to channel the questions through this person. And this is what they saw. Two black glittery skulls and a white fluffy penguin flying from yes to no, from yes to no. So they still didn't know who Rufy was, but you can imagine by this time, engagement levels are through the roof. And they're saying things like, this is the best TV I've seen in years. It was fantastic. We did have one more surprise for them. 
they'd noticed that Charles Leadbeater, a very famous person in relation to innovation and creativity, was making various appearances on Rufy's Tumblr account. And in a talk that Charles had um, given a few years ago, he was talking about pebbles and boulders. And by now, they knew that pebbles and boulders was a clue for something in relation to Rufy, but they didn't know what. Okay. Also, in Charles's book, We Think, there were lots of things he talked about there that felt like this weird thing that was going on, but they couldn't put their finger on it. So this very sense of kind of strangeness, you know. Um, so, by this point, they start thinking, is it Charles Leadbeater? Well, of course he's not, but, um, but it was amazing that they thought it could be. And so, at 11pm that night, they Hi, tuned in. I am Charlie Leadbeater. I am not Rufy Franzen, I promise you. <laughs> so this is it. Their minds are blown. Who the hell is Rufy Franzen and what kind of power does he have to be able to get Charles Leadbeater to talk to, you know, ah. Oh, Oh, wow. Anyway, by this point they knew where they had to be, they knew when they had to be there, they still didn't know why. So the next morning they made their way down to that big square, also known as the Triangle, and they followed a series of four square check-ins and QR codes. And in the end, the final QR code that they scanned um, started dialing a number. Now that number was actually the phone number for the guy who controls the big screen. And he was under strict instructions not to say anything when he answered the phone, but to just press play, get the films playing on the screen, text the number back and say, turn around and look at the screen. So many things could have gone wrong at this point. I don't think I stopped being nervous through the whole sort of two and a half months. Thankfully, it all worked out fine. The film started playing. They were absolutely amazed. They couldn't believe that their films are playing on this huge screen in the city centre of Manchester. Who has the power to do this? What the hell's going on? And who is Rufy Franzen? So that was the thing. We still had the reveal, and I'm quite nervous about that because obviously I put them into some dark places in order to drive them into this game. So we introduced Rufy, uh, Hugh as Rufy at this point, and then explained that Rufy didn't actually exist. Rufy was a device to drive them into an alternate reality game. We explained what an alternate reality game was, gave them a debriefing document, so they're delighted about seeing the films on the screen pretty shocked about the ARG, a bit worried at this point. Thankfully, once they digested it, again, something amazing happened. <laughs> Some of the students spent that weekend going back over the entire module. They'd finished the module, they'd submitted their work, but they were so desperate to join the dots and piece these clues together that they went back over every blog post, every video, every article, absolutely everything. They did the module again because they were curious. And what's great now, you know, I'm speaking to them now, we've had this really emotive learning experience together. We've all been scared, paranoid, angry, elated, disinterested at times. They're still curious, they're still questioning, and they're still looking beyond what's there. It's like their senses have been heightened, and they're looking at education and learning in terms of enlightenment and not just employment. I'm not the only one. I'm obsessed about deception and learning after this. There's a guy at George Mason University who runs a course lying about the past and he gets his learners to construct historical hoaxes online. Um, really upset Jimmy Wales because they managed to fill Wikipedia. They didn't fill Reddit, so go Reddit. But even the kids are at it. There was a 15-year-old girl recently suspended from school for setting up a fake Facebook page to highlight issues around bullying. Now, in this story, the fake character actually commits suicide, which got the girl into quite a lot of trouble, but it really highlights issues around cyberbullying, identity, deception, risk. You know, and we live in an age where pretty much anybody can post anything, can't they? And we need to develop our inbuilt crap detectors. You know, we've got these social platforms and all these means to be able to develop these wonderfully rich transmedia experiences for our learners in order to make them deeply, deeply curious and to develop digital literacies. You know, we live in a time when student fees are going up, students are becoming like consumers, it's all about mitigation of risk and standardisation. We need to make learners curious again, we need to make magic and we need to take risks. So the thing with curiosity is we can't teach people how to be curious in the way that we can maybe teach them how to, you know, work through creative processes. All we can do is to put opportunities to be curious in front of them and hope that they enjoy travelling down roads, travelling down paths that they may not ordinarily have taken. It's scary, it's risky, it's crazy, it's unpredictable 
and it can take us to some amazing places together with our learners. Thank you.